Section seven of Ulysses S. Grant by Owen Wister. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter five, part four. On the right, Hooker was unexpectedly strengthened by a part of Sherman's force, which the breaking of a bridge had prevented from following Sherman. Therefore, Grant turned Lookout Mountain into a more serious matter than he had planned. At the mountain's front, Hooker displayed himself, and while he thus occupied the enemy's attention on top, from behind them a part of his force came somewhat upon their rear through the drifting fog. Their picket was taken. From his post of observation on Orchard Knob, Grant saw the enemy coming down the mountain to oppose the advance there. But further round, the other force that had taken the picket was pressing on and up, and suddenly the Confederates saw this meeting invasion. They fired down uselessly. Though men fell in this steep scramble, the force came on through stones and thickets, and, joining with the force in front, ascended out of sight into the mist until Grant could often only hear the noise of the invisible guns nearer and nearer the top of the mountain. By night Hooker was established there. The Wednesday morning was cold and fine. The battle's change of shape from its original design was clear to see. Over on Sherman's side many troops were now massed against him nor on account of that unexpected gap between the end of the ridge and its continuation could he achieve his assault with the necessary celerity. Bragg had taken his troops from Lookout Mountain to oppose Sherman, and Bragg, should he see fit, might really get away without further harm to himself. So Hooker was ordered across from Lookout Mountain to interrupt his possible retreat. As Sherman came fighting along Missionary Ridge from the left, Bragg removed more and more troops from the center of the balcony to oppose him, so that up there the enemy's force was visibly growing thinner in the center as it grew thicker on the left. The shape of the battle was steadily changing. Something must be done to divert the enemy's increasing blows from Sherman. Hooker, coming behind them from Lookout Mountain, could do it. But no hooker was to be seen. His speed had been checked by a destroyed bridge. He was on his way, but not at hand, for this urgent hour. As we easily follow a boat race or a game on land from our arranged benches, so Grant and his staff from Orchard Knob saw, as it has only once or twice been seen before, the whole thunderous pageant flashing upon the hills of Chattanooga. And up there, inaccessible to help, Sherman was fighting the current of a gathering tide. Bragg's attention must be distracted from him down here, somehow. And so this battle takes its final unexpected splendid shape, and passes like a great song into our history. Four of our greatest, Thomas, Sherman, Sheridan, Grant, stand together in it, the only time they ever did so, a gathering of chiefs indeed, and with them in their splendor, as is fit, inspired by them to share their own renown, stands the American volunteer, reckless at the right time, suddenly immortal with wild, courageous wisdom. He is told, by way of experiment, to advance to the base of the hill, that center which Bragg had been thinning, and there take Bragg's lowest line of works. Again he goes steadily, as if on parade, with flags flying and music playing. Then he swiftly charges, and next finds himself master of the rifle pits, with prisoners captured he has not time to know how. Here he has been ordered to stop. But down on his head from the top pours such a stream of fire that staying is death while going back is failure. Twenty thousand of him crouch there, twenty thousand bodies, but one white-hot spirit 
transfigured and resistless. Without orders he rises, he climbs, he goes on his hands, he mounts the broken steep slant of hill, leading his captains as much as they lead him, and the astonished Grant from Orchard Knob sees him storm the crest and turn the enemy's guns upon themselves. It is done. Bragg is split in flying pieces. The stars and stripes wave upon Missionary Ridge. When Grant rode up among this seething triumph, the men quickly found him out and swarmed upon him by hundreds, embracing his feet and calling his name. And among all the gifts and tokens that presently showered upon him for this great November 25, even brighter than the gold medal voted by Congress is the memory of that Briarwood cigar case given him by a poor soldier who made it with his pocket knife. Now he sat in the center of his nation's bright day. Donelson, Vicksburg, Chattanooga melted together in his fame. Thanksgiving spread from his deed in widening circles. His message to the government, the pith of modesty. I believe I am not premature in announcing a complete victory over Bragg. Is enough and better than if it had been more. And Lincoln answered, God bless you all. And what did Sherman with his men do now? Having, without a moment's rest, after a march of over four hundred miles, without sleep for three successive nights, crossed the Tennessee, and fought their share of Chattanooga, and pursued the enemy out of Tennessee, they turned more than a hundred and twenty miles north, and compelled Longstreet to raise the siege of Knoxville, where Burnside was. When, in a few months, Grant was appointed full lieutenant-general under special act of Congress, he was the first since Washington, Winfield Scott being only brevet. He wrote to Sherman, What I want is to express my thanks to you and McPherson as the men to whom, above all others, I feel indebted for whatever I have had of success. How far your execution of whatever has been given you to do entitles you to the reward I am receiving, you cannot know as well as I do. And Sherman answered in a spirit equally noble, You do yourself injustice and us too much honor. In these letters the two men lay bare their best selves. And how well Sherman knew his friend. Now, as to the future, he says, do not stay in Washington. Halleck is better qualified than you to stand the buffets of intrigue and policy. For God's sake and your country's sake, come out of Washington. That is why Grant did come out when he was general-in-chief. Better, far better, had he never gone back as president. Assuredly, Sherman knew him very well. Ceremonies and crowds attended him after his arrival in Washington to receive his new rank. His actual arrival with his little boy was according to his own inveterate modesty. Unheralded from the train in the early morning, he waited his turn behind the more pushing travellers, and reached the hotel book last. Chittenden had told us how the transfixed hotel clerk changed his manner on reading U.S. Grant and Son, Galena, Illinois. Horace Porter records Lincoln's cry of welcome that evening. John Sherman writes to his brother of the adulations in Washington and his fear that Grant will be spoiled. And Grant's remark to Lincoln, Really, Mr. President, I have had enough of the show business, completes the picture. No, not quite. One week later, when he was in Nashville, arranging with Sherman the vast concluding process of the rebellion, the show business, in the shape of the mayor with a rosewood box and a sword, caught him again. Sherman's incomparably brisk pen has drawn the scene. The mayor rose and in a most dignified way read a finished speech to General Grant, who stood, as usual, very awkwardly 
and the mayor closed his speech by handing him the resolutions of the city council engrossed on parchment with a broad ribbon and large seal attached after the mayor had fulfilled his office so well general grant said mr mayor as i knew that this ceremony was to occur and as i am not used to speaking i have written something in reply he then began to fumble in his pockets first his breastcoat pocket then his pants vest and so on and after a considerable delay he pulled out a crumpled piece of common yellow cartridge paper which he handed to the mayor when read his answer was most excellent short concise and if delivered would have been all that the occasion required i could not help laughing at a scene so characteristic of the man to whom all had turned as the only one to guide the nation in a war that had become painfully critical so now he faced the conclusion from cairo in eighteen sixty one to chattanooga in eighteen sixty three he had marched forward narrowing the confederacy blow after blow here between washington and richmond only a hundred miles blow after blow had narrowed nothing in april eighteen sixty four they stood as they had started in april eighteen sixty one richmond was still to be taken lee still to be crushed three years six generals and a loss of one hundred and forty four thousand men had failed to do this from such failure grant received two great inheritances and with them succeeded his inheritances were to have his own way unhampered and the control of a perfect instrument the army of the potomac under general meade grant's detractors lay too much stress on the first inheritance he had his own way not only because lincoln had at length learned how disastrous meddling was but also because lincoln felt in his marrow that here was a man who would go on and do the thing he had met no such man till now he had been looking for one ceaselessly upon the army of the potomac and general meade too much stress cannot be laid without that engine and pilot the captain would have wrecked his vessel several times during forty-eight hours around spotsylvania he essayed direction of the tactics himself and wrought such havoc that thereafter he allowed the pilot meade full charge of this we may feel sure that grant underratedly at the beginning he had encountered no such genius in the west his remark that the army of the potomac had never been fought up its full capacity indicates that he expected quicker results than he got and the famous sentence from his letter near spotsylvania on may eleven i propose to fight it out on this line if it takes all summer plainly shows brief anticipations it took until the following april and in his own report one reads between the lines something like an apology for these terrible battles he says whether they might have been better in conception and execution is for the people who mourn the loss of friends fallen and who have to pay the pecuniary cost to say all i can say is that what i have done has been done conscientiously to the best of my ability and in what i conceived to be for the best interests of the whole country his conception was to hammer continuously until by mere attrition there should be nothing left of the enemy he reduced the problem not to who can win the greatest victories but to who can stand the heaviest losses to state it thus was to solve it it was not military but it was deeply sagacious it was like columbus and the egg it was also a confession of lee's superiority the fact that lee had the interior lines is not sufficient counterbalance these awful battles add not to grant's but to lee's reputation 
On his side, Lee evidently underrated Grant. He, too, had been used to other generals, generals who struck a blow and then sat down. But it was never to be like that any more. There were two ways for Grant to move from the Potomac on land to Richmond, by the right flank, westward and inland, an easier country to fight in, a harder line of communications to cover, by the left flank, southeastward, nearer the water, a harder country, easier communication. To move immediately south of Richmond by water, and from there cut its supporting railroads was well enough, provided Lee would keep himself inside Richmond's fortifications while this was going on. But it was unlikely he would do now what he had never done before. On the contrary, he could be expected so to enlarge his circumference of protection that to envelop him would spread the army out too thin, and bear its extended flanks to disadvantageous attack while fighting for possession of the radiating railroads. Moreover, since Lee had to be bitterly encountered somewhere, it was better to meet him further from his home and nearer our own supplies. This, too, for a while, screamed Washington. Grant moved by the left flank May 3rd, choosing a midnight start but Lee saw him before he could get beyond the unpropitious country and compelled a battle May 5. On that beginning day the two crossed weapons, both of perfect steel. Lee handled his like a great swordsman, Grant handled his like a great blacksmith. Lee had some 70,000 men, Grant some 120,000. Day and often night the weapons struck fire at some point, day and night during not weeks but months. Some of these clashes have names forever reddened with slaughter, the Wilderness, Spotsylvania, North Anna, Cold Harbor. But in between them flow nameless streams of blood continuously. More sublimely shines the American volunteer at Cold Harbor than at Chattanooga, more sublime in walking calmly to visible death than in tumultuously rushing to victory. He stood in the center with the enemy in a great half-wheel around him, and knowing that someone had blundered, walked into this. First he wrote his name and home, and fastened the address to his clothes. Thus they would know whose body it was. Then, at the word, he went. Six thousand Union soldiers were killed at Cold Harbor in one hour. In the Book of Noble Deeds, from Thermopylae down, is there a more heroic page than this? By November 1, Grant had lost 80,000 men, more than Lee began with. The Army of the Potomac, the weapon of fine temper, was hacked into a saw by the usage it had received nor was Lee crushed yet, nor Richmond yet taken. In Grant's pictures the story is plain, the saddened eyes, the worn face, the mouth shut down tight all around. The heavy strain, heavier these months than Lincoln's, with distant campaigns to plan, near battles to fight, disloyal politics in the North, and the usual popular imbecile clamor for a change or a cessation, bore Grant down inwardly. He carried the Union on his back, and other generals had failed him, and he had been a disappointment to himself. He gave in to drink, it seems, at times. Discovering this, Ben Butler appears to have blackmailed him. He had requested Butler's removal for bad conduct at Petersburg. Butler visited him. He backed down. Not from personal fear. The Union cause was trembling in politics. A public tale of drink might remove the general and split the Union forever. Presently Sherman's and Sheridan's successes clinched Lincoln's election. Next, Butler showed incompetence again. Then Grant dismissed him. Butler could have published as much about drink as he pleased, the Union was safe. 
Wound up in this, contemporaneously rather than logically, is General W. F. Smith's severe fate. Under first impressions of him received at Chattanooga, Grant had thought him worthy a high command, and at this time designed him for Butler's successor. But in the same twenty-four hours with Butler's blackmail, General Smith criticized to Grant's face the Battle of Cold Harbor. Thinking this over, it struck Grant that General Smith had meant to whip him over Meade's shoulder, as he phrased it. He relieved his campaign of so captious a subordinate. It was perhaps advisable, but seems harsh. Yet if the North was dismayed by Grant's destructive battles, still more so was the South. They felt the end coming. Each bloody crisis saw Grant move on. Such a thing had not been seen before. Early's almost successful attempt to take Washington did not frighten Grant from his siege of Petersburg. He merely let Sheridan loose upon Early and broke him. That also settled the Shenandoah Valley, secession's fertile incubator and truck garden. Sent there during three years to handle it with gloves, our soldiers had seen it so periodically that they called it Harper's Weekly. At length, Sheridan, though inexcusably brutal in his barn burning, yet in destroying crops and forage merely treated the valley as it should have been treated at first. But secession considered that Union should fight with gloves. When Union began to fight to a finish, secession cried out. Sheridan is still denounced, but secession's massacre of Fort Pillow and burning of Chambersburg are not mentioned. So the South knew that in Grant's deadly grip and will was something fateful never met till now. And that grip was seizing it elsewhere. Besides Sheridan, Sherman was closing in upon it in Georgia, and Thomas soon struck it heavily at Nashville. These simultaneous strides of disaster had all been set and kept in motion by the single central will and no matter what the impatient country said, the President stood Grant's friend through thick and thin. The Secretary of War had made one supreme effort to maintain his dictatorship over the movements of the army. The report of his fall is thus. Hearing from Grant that certain troops were to be disposed in a certain way, he objected that he had other plans and could not allow it, Grant said, But the order has been given. The domineering Stanton then objected much more, and always, when he paused, Grant imperturbably replied, But the order has been given. The secretary rushed to Lincoln. Lincoln said, But Congress has made him general of all the armies. The secretary still poured himself out, and still the deprecating Lincoln murmured only, but Congress has made him general of all the armies. There it stopped permanently. And Lincoln's words to Grant through this time, though once he expresses a hope that as few lives as possible may be sacrificed, show his deep faith and his deep satisfaction in his aggressive, indomitable general. In August he writes, the particulars of your campaign I neither know nor seek to know. I wish not to intrude any restraints or constraints upon you. Grant's reply unites a modesty and a self-reliance that Lincoln had not heard until this general came. Should my success be less than I desire or expect, the least I can say is the fault is not yours. No wonder Lincoln liked his new commander. He writes again, when less firm spirits at Washington had been counseling a halt, I have seen your dispatch expressing your unwillingness to break your hold where you are. Neither am I willing. Hold on with a bulldog grip and chew and choke as much as possible. End of chapter 5, part 4《Section Eight of Ulysses S. Grant by Owen Wister. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter Five, 
Part Five. The withers of the South were being wrung. Side failures did nothing to obscure the looming end. The great blows of Sherman, Sheridan, and Thomas sent their shocks to the heart of secession, and at the heart sat Grant holding Lee tight in Richmond. It is recorded of his ceaseless work at this period that on one day he wrote forty-two important dispatches. This winter was a time of thought for the weary, disenchanted Southern people, and a time of desperation on the part of their political misleaders. In early February some of these had, in good faith, visited Grant to talk of peace, which talk he had tactfully evaded, while showing them all hospitality at his headquarters. With tact still greater, he had persuaded Lincoln to come and see them himself instead of sending Seward as an emissary. But this ended in nothing, save that Grant's character and kindness won the high admiration of the Confederate Vice President Stevens, who wrote, He is one of the most remarkable men I ever met. He does not seem to be aware of his powers. Presently, again the South asked for a peace talk, this time through General Lee, who addressed Grant in a letter but Grant explained that terms of peace were not in his province, that his authority allowed him to act only regarding military subjects, such as the exchange of prisoners, and the matter stopped there. Lee's actions and spirit must be kept wide apart from those of the secession politicians at this time and at all times. Under the inspiration of Jefferson Davis, in the spring, a manifesto issued from the Confederate Congress, which struggled to goad the people to further efforts and sacrifices by such prophecies as follow. If the Union won, not only would the property and estates of vanquished rebels be confiscated, but they would be divided and distributed among our African bondsmen. Our enemies have threatened to deport our entire white population and supplant it with a new population drawn from their own territories and from European countries. The manifesto further says, Failure makes us vassals of an arrogant people. Failure will compel us to drink the cup of humiliation, even to the bitter dregs of having the history of our struggle written by New England historians. But even this excruciating peril seemed to the southern people, whose sons were dead and whose livelihood was gone, a less calamity than paying a thousand dollars of their money for a barrel of flour, and seeing their white-haired fathers and fifteen-year-old boys now forcibly thrown into the mill of blood. They wanted peace. They began to see in Jefferson Davis and his associates not a group of patriots, but a heartless, selfish, unscrupulous gang of intriguers. They began to go home from the army. There was no pay and no food for those who devotedly remained faithful to Lee. Grant was closing in. On April 3, Lee had to break cover and retreat from Richmond. Davis fled southward and even while flying and with full knowledge of the crumbling house he made another speech to lure if possible more victims to the slaughter we have now entered upon a new phase of the struggle he said relieved from the necessity of guarding particular points our army will be free to move from point to point to strike the enemy in detail far from his base few could have believed him but the soldiers, ragged and starved, followed and fought under their beloved Lee across the rainy fields of Virginia. No successes now changed a muscle of Grant's impassive face. Nothing but the capture of prisoners wakened visible elation in him. Each prisoner meant one enemy less to fight, one more life saved from fruitless sacrifice. Of his thoughts, only his actions show anything. When leaving headquarters at City Point on March 29 for this last struggle, he bade his wife good-bye with more than his daily tenderness, which was always great. He kissed her again and again at the door, 
as though their next meeting might never be, or would not be, until after much had happened. Then Lincoln walked to the train with him, said, God bless you all, with an unsteady voice, and they moved away to begin the taking of Richmond. The President, said Grant, is one of the few who have not attempted to extract from me a knowledge of my movements, although he is the only one who has a right to know them. Rain fell the next day and dulled the army spirits, but weather made no change in the quiet general. And Sheridan rode in through the rain from his cavalry to headquarters, talked with the staff and with Grant, and departed to his coming battles like a meteor, leaving a trail of fired enthusiasm behind him. To this star, in these final days, the great wagon of the army seemed hitched. Whatever they separately did, and they were doing something during every hour, the fierce white light of Sheridan's genius beats upon the whole, and his deeds against the enemy are like strokes of lightning. On the morning of April 3, Lincoln came to Grant in captured Petersburg, and shook his hand, and poured out his thanks a long while. He said this was something like his expectations, only that he had imagined Sherman would have been brought from the South to share in it. Then he learned more of his general's tact, for Grant told him it was justice that the army which fought Lee from the beginning should fight him at the end and divide the glory with no one. Thus there could be no rancor. The close partisans of Meade, bitter over the great slight which history has so far done his fame, contend that he should have received the final surrender. But a later generation must think that this belonged to the general-in-chief. Had Grant's brooding mind been occupied with any thoughts save how best to end the matter, and how best to be merciful to the vanquished, he could scarcely be excused. But he thought neither of himself nor of any other of the victors. So he and Lincoln talked together a while at Petersburg, and understood each other well. For one thought filled them both, leniency. Then Grant went forward and learned of Richmond's fall. But no wish to enter and gloat over his prize was in the conqueror's heart. As he had asked at Donelson, why humiliate a brave enemy, and, as at Vicksburg he had forbidden a cheer to be raised over the surrendered, or any taunt made as they passed, so now he avoided Richmond, and Lee's last march went on. The good deeds and the exploits of Sheridan's cavalry spurred the infantry to a race. The pursuit quickened, and Sheridan, striking blow on blow at the front, forever called back for greater speed. Lee must not escape to Danville. Lee must be headed off and compelled to fight again. Newhall, of Sheridan's staff, writes, All along the road were evidences of the demoralization of the enemy. Flankers and scouting parties of cavalry were continually bringing in scores of prisoners from the woods on either side prisoners who would throw down their arms at the sight of blue uniforms and request to be captured. The steadfast women who begged them to turn back and face us again had been laughed to scorn. At dark on April 5, word came from Sheridan to Grant, I wish you were here. I see no escape for General Lee. Grant called for his horse and rode through the night to Sheridan and Meade and on the next day at Sailor's Creek the clouds sank lower round Lee. Again Grant's actions reveal his thoughts. On Friday, April 7, he wrote Lee, The last week must convince you of the hopelessness of further resistance. I regard it as my duty to shift from myself the responsibility of any further effusion of blood by asking of you the surrender of the Army of Northern Virginia. The unsuccessful battles, the dwindling regiments, the starvation, the retreat cut off, all this was plainly the end, and it stared Lee in the face. But on such a sight Lee had not at first 
the moral strength to open his eyes. The pain was too blinding. In his youth he had taken an oath to support the government. That government had educated him to be a soldier. He had been against secession. But when the time came to choose between secession and his oath, he chose, not without reluctance, to break his oath and turn against the government the teaching it had given him. And now here he sat, with his lost cause, like a broken idol in his hands. For a moment he shrank from the final pang of renunciation. I have received your note, he replied to Grant, on that same Friday, though not entertaining the opinion you express of the hopelessness of further resistance, I reciprocate your desire to avoid useless effusion of blood, and therefore ask the terms you will offer. And Grant, on Saturday, replied, Peace being my great desire, there is but one condition, that the men and officers surrendered shall be disqualified for taking up arms until properly exchanged. And then follows a touch of his perfect consideration for the defeated opponent. I will meet you, or will designate officers to meet any officers you may name. So did Washington write to Cornwallis, as Horace Porter reminds us. But Lee would himself go through with whatever had to come. Only still he pushed the bitter cup away from him. I cannot meet you with a view to surrender, he answered, but as far as your proposal may tend to the restoration of peace, I shall be pleased to meet you. And he named Sunday morning on the old stage road between the picket lines. This disappointing word came to Grant in the heart of the night, where he lay sleepless from many hours of pain in his head. Hunger, fatigue, exposure, and strain had brought on such torments that he had allowed remedies to be tried, but without avail. He lay down again. In the early hours he was found walking up and down outside, holding his head with both hands. He now wrote a third time to Lee, that he had no authority to treat of peace, but that peace could be had, and lives and property saved by the South laying down their arms. An urgency, almost an appeal, pervades this letter. He then declined advice to take an ambulance for the sake of his severe pain, and, mounting once more, proceeded toward Sheridan's front. It was near noon now, and as he went, a dispatch overtook him. Time and further mischances had brought Lee to the point. He requested an interview for the purpose of surrender according to the terms offered. As Grant read and understood that here in his hand at last lay peace, all pain left him. He dismounted, and by the roadside wrote his answer. While he was doing this, and hurrying forward to the meeting, Lee, some six miles away, lay waiting. Stretched on a blanket under an apple tree by the road, he contemplated the sunshine that bathed Virginia. Of his thoughts also only his actions reveal anything. When Grant's note reached him, he rose, and had soon ridden into Appomattox Courthouse, and in a house there waited for Grant. In a little while Grant reached the grassy village street, and there, dismounted, stood Sheridan and others. No significant words were spoken in this hour. Silence is the only reference that men make to great events which they are in the midst of. The ordinary greetings of every day were briefly given. The house where General Lee waited was pointed out to Grant, and he went in, leaving most of the others upon the porch. There they sat, while General Lee's gray horse cropped the grass near them. Quietness was over the little village, and the armies lying in the country round. The door opened, and two of those on the porch were signed to come in. They entered, it is said, treading as those do who steal into a sick chamber, while the rest still sat on the porch. 
When the door next opened, they rose. For out of it General Lee came, splendid, tall, gray-bearded, immovable. They looked at him and his sword and spotless gray uniform. He stood absently on the step, gazing away across Virginia, and two or three times he struck one hand against the other. Then, having spoken no word, and noticing his gray horse that had been brought him, he mounted and rode away. As he was going, Grant came through the door, saluted him in silence, and in silence also rode away. When Lee reached his army, the faithful men swarmed around him, cheering not their common misfortune, but the peace that he had made. They mingled their grief with his, grasping his hands, and then, almost overcome, he spoke. Men, we have fought through the war together. I have done the best I could for you. What Grant's features concealed on that day, we know now from him. What General Lee's feelings were, I do not know. But my own, which had been quite jubilant on the receipt of his letter, were sad and depressed. I felt like anything, rather than rejoicing at the downfall of a foe who had fought so long and valiantly, and had suffered so much for a cause, though that cause was, I believe, one of the worst for which a people ever fought, and one for which there was the least excuse. But inside the house, what had gone on between the two chiefs? The witnesses watched and moved always with the hush of a sick-room, and after the first greeting, when they sat down, it became Grant, who shrank from the point. He talked to Lee about Mexico and old times, and how good peace was going to be now. And twice Lee had to remind him of the business they had to do. Then Grant wrote, as always, simple and clear words. In the middle his eye fell upon Lee's beautiful sword, and the chivalric act which it prompted has knighted his own spirit forever. The surrender, he instantly wrote, would not embrace the side-arms of the officers, nor their private horses or baggage. When Lee's eyes reached that sentence, his face changed for the first time, and he said, This will have a very happy effect upon my army. He then told what was new to Grant, that the horses ridden by the men were their own. Again the conqueror's tenderness lifted him into a realm diviner than the renown of victory. He ordered that the men take the animals home with them to work their little farms. To this nobility Lee's own responded. This will have the best possible effect upon the men, he said. Moved to greater frankness, he told Grant of his army's hunger, and for this also Grant at once provided. These are the things which the conqueror had done when he came out of the house with unrelaxed countenance and rode away. As he went, he heard firing from his lines. It was in honor of the news, already spreading. He stopped these salutes at once. The war is over, he said. The rebels are our countrymen again. Thus, when his strength had quelled the four years' storm, did a rainbow rise from his great heart across the heavens of our native land. End of chapter 5, part 5「Nine of Ulysses S. Grant by Owen Wister. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter six. Not even if space were left should his after days be told. It is not for them that we remember and bless him. The further we recede from him, the more they sink away and leave him shining in his greatness at Appomattox, a hero in a soldier's dress, with sword not drawn, but sheathed. There his figure stands immortal, 
and there his real life ends. For living is action up to the soul's highest excellence, and many who eat their three meals a day are dead as dormails. Grant rose to his full height again only when he came to die. As president, he was no more himself than he had been when tanning leather. Men far less worthy have sat more worthily in the White House. It was foretold, silently. Sherman, his dear friend, was set against it and would not say a word for it. Did he not know the world's great soldiers and what babies they became as statesmen, Wellington latest of all? More still, he knew his friend. But we Americans, the most consistently inconsistent people on earth, have passed a century in abusing our army, and in electing every military hero we could get for president. Washington, Jackson, Harrison, Taylor, Grant. When Lincoln was taken from us, no man was so loved as Grant, and therefore, without asking or caring to know how he could have learned statesmanship, in our gratitude we twice gave him the greatest gift we have. Before this happened, his straightforward goodness and the power that he had did much to heal the scars of war. Andrew Johnson wanted Lee tried for treason, and Grant stopped it by threatening to resign his commission. In those days the Southern General Taylor writes of him, He came frequently to see me, was full of kindness, and anxious to promote my wishes. His action had endeared him to all Southern men. His bearing and conduct at this time were admirable, modest, and generous. He declared his ignorance of and distrust for politics and politicians, with which and whom he intended to have nothing to do. Certainly Johnson did not better Grant's opinion of politicians, nor did those men who now led the South far and wide astray from the noble spirit of Lee at Appomattox. Their continued malignity lost them a great chance, and cost the South dear. Following their manifesto at Richmond, already quoted, they now met each step of clemency with a temper which is completely heralded in the words of Henry A. Wise when he surrendered, We won't be forgiven, we hate you, and that is the whole of it. They now, with an arrogance which our language has no word to express, demanded to return to Congress on the old slave ratio. This gave white owners the benefit of their slaves by adding three-fifths of the number of the black non-voting population to the sum of the white voting population. Slaves were free now, but this was the arrangement which the South proposed to continue. Let the reader pause and take it in. Johnson, for personal reasons, encouraged it and alarmed Congress. Naturally, the North lost patience, and Grant lost his patience, too. This swept away the Fourteenth Amendment, an admirable device by which any state could deny a vote to a part of its male population, on condition that its representation in Congress was proportionately reduced. This elastic remedy, which held hope, was destroyed by the precipitate deplorable blunder of the Fifteenth Amendment, the evils of which have stained our soil with increasing blood each year, and developed that barbarism of which the South has had too great a share from the beginning. But when leaders came to Grant offering him the presidency, either he forgot his opinion of politics, or, and signs point to this, he thought, as another hero has thought since, that being president was an easy matter. None of us can measure such a temptation without having it. As General Taylor writes, perhaps none but a divine being can resist such a temptation. Strange, very strange, is Grant's conduct after his election. He left the world. He went into a sort of retreat at Galena. He would see no party leaders. He ordered no letter sent to him. He would make no speeches. He disclosed his plans to no one. 
We can only guess his thoughts during this time by his acts following it. They were honest and helpless. Evidently he wished to govern without politics, as he had made war without politics. He wished to choose men as he had chosen generals, for their fitness as he judged them. He did not perceive the vast difference, that war at once lays bare a soldier's fitness to the bone, while peace may hide incompetence and dishonesty for many years. As an illustration of Grant's total blindness to the proprieties of civil government, his choosing Mr. Stewart, Secretary of the Treasury, will serve. He very naturally thought so great a merchant would fill the place well. He appointed him without consulting him. The Senate confirmed the appointment. Then a law was discovered forbidding men in foreign trade to hold this position. Grant asked to have the law changed. But we will not dwell upon his many improprieties of administration. Favoritism, too constant acceptance of presents, too great obstinacy in forcing his notions, invincible misunderstanding of the difference between a lieutenant-general and a president. It may be said that when he happened upon good guides, such as Hamilton Fish, his acts were wise, as in the Alabama case, where he was as right as Sumner was wrong, or as in his courageous veto of the inflation bill in 1874. When he listened to thieves and impostors, as in the San Domingo matter, his acts were mistaken and dangerous, and, alas, unchanged from his childhood innocence revealed in the horse story, he remained such a mark for thieves and impostors that he came to sit in a sort of center of corruption, credulous to the bitter end. For the end was the bitterest of all. After his second term, when he had gone round the world and met most of the great people in it, and returned man enough of the world to remark humorously that at Windsor Queen Victoria had been too anxious to put him at his ease, and after his unwilling candidacy for a third term had been frustrated, after all his experience he fell a dupe to a Wall Street gambler. He became a special partner. His name was used to further a brazen scheme of thievery. Into the business he put a hundred thousand dollars, and drew two and three thousand a month income, without wondering how such returns could be. When the crash came on May 6, 1884, it was inconceivable to the world at first that he was not guilty. Presently, by his conduct and statements, by his making over to his creditor, Mr. Vanderbilt, all the property that he owned, and refusing Mr. Vanderbilt's generous attempts to give it back to him, the world recognized his innocence. Help was offered this ex-president, who had not now enough money to pay the milkman. Most touchingly, a stranger, Mr. Wood, sent him instantly five hundred dollars, and soon five hundred more, as his share of the nation's debt to him. More elaborate attempts to assist him were begun, but he rejected them, and under the whole shock his body gave way. But his spirit rose. He was asked to write war articles, and presently was able to pay Mr. Wood with the first fruits of his pen. Then, for weeks, sometimes in such torture from the cancer in his throat that drinking water was like swallowing molten lead to him, he fought death away while he wrote his memoirs. The tribute of the country in making him general once more on March 4, 1885, deeply pleased him. But he was shaken by it, and grew worse. Reviving, however, his vast will pushed on with the book, in order to leave something for his wife's support. He had no voice any more, but whispered his dictation, and wrote on days when he was strong enough. He held death away until the book was finished, and then gave death leave to come. In June he had been taken up the Hudson River to Mount McGregor, near Saratoga, from his New York house. 
His eyes followed West Point as the train passed by it. On July 3 his old friend Buckner of Donelson came affectionately to bid him farewell, and he spoke of his happiness in the growing harmony between North and South. On July 9, in a trembling pencil, he wrote to Mr. Wood, I am glad to say that, while there is much unblushing wickedness in this world, yet there is a compensating generosity and grandeur of soul. In my case I have not found that republics are ungrateful, nor are the people. On July 23 he died. To pay his debts, he had so utterly stripped himself of all his trophies and possessions that there was not left a uniform to clothe his body or a sword to lay upon his coffin. Today he rests in his tomb at Riverside. But his greatest visible monument is the book. Quite apart from its history, which here and there needs amendment, and quite independent of its masterly prose, it is a picture of a noble, modest, great heart. As Lincoln asked Grant after Corinth, how does it all sum up? Let poetry, which is the summing of all substance, reply. My good blade carves the casks of men, my tough lance thrusteth sure, my strength is as the strength of ten, because my heart is pure. End of chapter 6 End of Ulysses S. Grant by Owen Wister